It's really good to see all of you this morning, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, you've made it uh, through welcome days. Uh, I guess we didn't get rained out after all, though obviously we had uh, pretty hard rain on, what was that, Thursday, and, and some on Friday, but uh, good to see you this morning for this worship service. This is really one of the uh, high points of welcome days and our welcome, welcoming uh, of all of our new students uh, to HBU, as well as, of course, welcoming back those who, who are already uh, students at the university. I'm glad that we have some parents and others with us uh, because uh, uh, we, want, we want you to know uh, as a university how we intend to welcome and receive, um, receive your child or grandchild. Uh, and uh, we want you to know, uh, have reinforced for you what our convictions are uh, as a university. I want to share with you uh, some thoughts uh, on this Sunday morning. This is the Lord's Day, and, and we have, a, it, this is, of course, a, a worship service, uh, which, uh, again, is very indicative of who we are at HBU. I want to share with you some thoughts uh, uh, from uh, just a, a very brief context at the end of 1 Corinthians 16. Uh, now, uh, the, the great apostle Paul uh, wrote uh, 13 letters. They're contained in what's called the the collection known as the New Covenant, the New Covenant, which he inaugurated uh, by virtue of his death. Uh, so uh, the great uh, covenant that God made with Abraham and then continued through Isaac and Jacob has now been renewed. The prophet Jeremiah had said that one day uh, God would write a new covenant on the hearts of his people, that they would no longer be disobedient to him, but would be renewed and be able to do his purpose and his work in the world. And so uh, by virtue of this uh, new covenant that has been established through the death and resurrection of Jesus, the great apostle Paul, apostle means messenger, has been uh, called and set apart. And he's been told that he's to preach this message called the gospel uh, all over the earth. And that particularly uh, he, though he starts off by going to synagogues and to Jewish pl uh, places of prayer, uh, eventually uh, that uh, inevitably leads to his uh, preaching more extensively to the non-Jewish world also in the New Testament, called the nations, or called the Gentile world. And so he preaches uh, to the Gentiles the message that the Jewish king has come and been crucified, has been dramatically raised from the dead, and that in fact he's not just the Jewish Messiah, the Jewish king, but he's Lord over all the nations. And the Old Testament story of the nations being scattered is now being reversed as, as all the peoples of the earth, Jew and Gentile, are being brought uh, to a singular point of worship, to a unified uh, point of community and worship, and that is through the Jewish Messiah, Jesus, who is, in fact, the living Lord. And so Paul travels around, and he, he preaches this message. He has been to a, uh, the city of Corinth already on one of his uh, missionary travels and spent a significant time there. Um, he, he really wants to get back to Corinth. Uh, there, uh, he has a great fondness and affection for the Corinthians, and on his travels, he's, he's not at his home. He, he was raised in Tarsus. He was educated predominantly in Jerusalem. The church that sort of uh, nurtured him uh, to a great extent uh, and sent him and Barnabas out as missionaries was Antioch. He's in none of those places. He has traveled around. But he stayed for a while in Corinth, and he loves the Corinthians. There are also problems in Corinth. There are divisions. And so he, he's writing them letters to encourage them to be united and to have their faith uh, strengthened and, and renewed. When Paul writes what we call 1 Corinthians, uh, some uh, uh, Paul didn't call it 1 Corinthians. In fact, Paul had probably written a, a previous letter to the Corinthians by the time he, he writes this letter. But at any rate, uh, when, when uh, Paul writes this particular letter, we, we label it 1 Corinthians. If you'll look at chapter 16, uh, he indicates that he wants to, to get uh, as soon as he can to Corinth. He, he loves them and he he, he wants to get there. He's anxious to get there because uh, there have been some divisions. But he's in Ephesus, another one of his favorite uh, places. He stayed in Ephesus for at least two years, maybe three years on one of his travels. So he's in Ephesus. He's going to write the Christians in Corinth. He's, he's particularly, um, he's particularly uh, in First and Second Corinthians, he, he has poured out his heart to them, longing for them to be unified. And, and now he says that he, he, wants, uh, he wants to come uh, see them, and uh, he, he gives them a little bit uh, of his uh, of his traveling uh, itinerary. But if you look at First Corinthians um, chapter sixteen, he says, verse five, "But I shall come to you 
after I go through Macedonia. He's going to go north out of a Roman province of uh, Asia, and then he's going to cross the Aegean Sea at the north uh, from uh, Troas to uh, Samothrace, Neapolis. And then he, he's going to, that, that's, that's Macedonia, northern Greece. And then he's going to go south towards uh, Achaia. He's going to go south towards, uh, towards the city of Corinth. He says, I shall come to you after I go through Macedonia, for I'm going through Macedonia. That's his travel plan. And perhaps I shall stay with you or even spend the winter there that you may send me on my way wherever I may go. For I don't want to see you just in passing. I don't want it to be just a, a quick visit. I want to stay there for a while is his point. He, he loves the Corinthians and he's, he's in Ephesus. He longs to, to go to Corinth. But there's, there's something holding him back in Ephesus. He says, For I do not wish to see you now just in passing, for I hope to remain with you for some time if the Lord permits. Paul sees all of his life as directed by the hand of God. Even though he doesn't always know what the next step is going to be, he sees his life under the direction of the Spirit of Christ. If the Lord permits. But, verse 8, I shall remain in Ephesus until Pentecost until uh, the spring. One of the Jewish festivals is Pentecost. Doesn't mean he's going to go to Jerusalem and celebrate Pentecost. That's just the point on the calendar. I shall remain in Ephesus until Pentecost. Why? He gives two reasons. As much as he wants to see the Corinthians, as much as he's going to assure them that he will get there and it won't just be in passing, he'll stay there for a while. He's going to stay in Ephesus for now for two reasons. For a wide door, translated here for effective service. It really says a door wide and effectively powerful. There are two adjectives for this door. This door is wide and it's effective, or the word can sometimes be translated powerful. A door wide and powerful, probably in its impact, has been, is opened to me, he says, God has done something. He's opened this, this door. And the second reason he's going to stay, this is, this is very interesting, I think. It's counterintuitive. He says, and there are many adversaries. He doesn't say, although there are many adversaries. He says, and there are many adversaries. I'm going to remain in Ephesus until now for two reasons. A door wide and effective has been opened to me and their adversaries. It's going to take a while to do what God has called him to do. The word, just two or three thoughts for you as students entering the, the new year. The word door here, you know, doors typically, when you use that metaphorically, it means a point of access. And it rather means that here. But the emphasis is, is slightly, slightly different. It's not just the way to get somewhere. It's the opportunity. It's the opportunity to have a powerful impact. The door wide and powerfully effective. The door that's wide and that can have great results is opened to me. He's speaking of the opportunity. God has, uh, in, uh, in the, the circumstances of Paul's life, uh, brought him to Ephesus. We can read from the book of Acts that he had enormous conflicts in Ephesus. Uh, but still, God has brought him there. And now he has the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So here's Paul's calling in life. He's an apostle. He's supposed to travel. He's supposed to preach the gospel. This is what he's called to do. And, and though he wants to go here, and he has an ambition to, to be uh, with with the, the Corinthians, as soon as he can, he's going to stay in Ephesus. Why? Because that's where the opportunity in the hands of God has been given him. And it's going to take a while because there's opposition. There's a fight to be fought, you might say. Life has, uh, life has moments. I don't mean seconds in the literal sense. I mean moments in the sense of it's, it's special moments. And I, I want to suggest to all of us, but to, to you particularly as students, that coming to a university, 
coming back to the university or transferring to this university or just starting university life is a great opportunity. It's, it's one of those special moments in life. In the hands of God, it's been given to you. In the providence of God, it's been given to you. You have this enormous opportunity. And, and what a university can do for you, this, this, remember Paul says it's a wide door and effective. That is the, the, the opportunity, the, the possibility of, of, of its results, the things that can happen, this wide and effective door. The door won't affect it, but seizing the opportunity will produce great effects is the point powerful results. We know from you know, social scientific studies what university uh, can, can do for, for, uh, for students. Of course, it, it's not, I would contend, it's not the most, the most important time in life, but it's one of the most important uh, thresholds and, and doors of opportunity in life. Being nurtured in your mother's womb is no doubt the most significant nine-month period in anyone's life. I, I, I'm not being sentimental when I say that. I, that's, that's a simple fact. Being held and nursed and hugged and loved by mother and father in those earliest uh, weeks, days, weeks, months, years, those are absolutely critical to the formation of, of conscience, of character, of body, of spirit. But getting, having the opportunity to, to learn at different stages of life. I think when you're four and five years old, it's an absolutely critical time. When you're two years old, four and five. But the university experience from 18 to 22 or 18 to 35, whenever the opportunity comes to you, whenever that opportunity comes, it's an absolutely critical opportunity. We, we know that people who have a university education, there's been discussion of this lately, but the facts are clear. People who have a university education have, have a far greater opportunity for a job. They have a, an expanded opportunity for income. They have an expanded opportunity for social networks and, 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 and friendship formation. They, you'll make some of the greatest friends of your life in a, in a, uh, because of your college years and because of the results of your college years. You have the opportunity to discover more about who you are and, and what God has given you to be. You have the opportunity to, to think about, okay, here's my, not just my job, which is a, a, a wonderful opportunity that universities give young people, but, but my calling, which is bigger than a job. It's, it's who I am and what I'm made to be and the kind of work, the kinds of things I'm supposed to do. All of us are supposed to work. Work's not a bad thing. Work is a wonderful thing. It means fulfilling your gifts and your calling and, and all of those capacities that you have. But you can oftentimes, uh, not only throughout life, in home and church, but also in, in the university setting, you will be challenged. There will be, there will be, there will be difficult moments. There will, be, there will be ideas that you haven't thought of before. Your mind, your heart, your friendships, uh, your emotions, all of those will be expanded. It's a great opportunity to learn who you are and to have that calling, that sense of purpose and meaning in life. And, and friends, lifelong friends, and maybe for many, for many people, uh, they, they meet husband or wife right in their college days. I've if you hear one of our alumni talk about uh, their HBU experience of 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, they will often say, well, that's where I met my wife. That's where I met my husband. So it's, it's a, it's a life-transforming series of years. It's a tremendous opportunity. And I, I say to you, don't, don't miss it. I say to you, don't give up too easily. I promise you, here's a promise. I want to make to you, it won't be easy. Nothing in life that's worthwhile is easy. I just read a study the other day that talked about the learning experience and how important it is actually when, when you, the, the difference, they're doing studies on, on the West Coast about, about the impact on, on the brain when you actually concentrate. It's one thing to take a book, say a piece of uh, very light reading, and, and they're attached electrodes and so on, and, and to see what happens to the brain with light reading, and then to see what happens to the brain when the same person is doing some sort of significant reading. So you might say thoughtful reading or concentrated reading. And what it does to the brain is, is, is powerfully different. So it won't be easy. It'll be a challenge. No no. No musician ever just sort of quickly learned how to be a pianist or a guitarist or a violinist. 
people who sing. Yes, I know many people are gifted in certain ways and have natural abilities, but, but, but athletes and musicians and scientists and, and philosophers and, and electricians and engineers and ministers and attorneys and doctors, it, it, you have, it won't be easy. But there's a, there's a certain commitment of effort that's, that's ex- especially challenging early on. But, but uh, you know, uh, Malcolm Gladwell has uh, referred to the research that talks about sort of getting over the hump with 10,000 hours. People who sort of commit themselves over a period of time with a, with a large quantity of hours in concentrated effort, they, they eventually, eventually sort of get over a hump, whether it's learning how to play the clarinet or whether it's learning how to write. Writing is difficult. Whatever it may be, it, it, it won't be easy. But there's a certain hump that can be gotten over, and then, and then it becomes easier. And then you have to challenge yourself again as you reach a new level to, to take it, as we say with the, the modern-day cliche, to take it to the next level and to continue for all of your life to try in all ways to, quote, get better at what you do. I promise you it won't be easy. Remember the passage. Paul says, Paul says a, a door wide and effective. I'm going to stay in Ephesus until Pentecost because a door wide and effective has opened for me, and there are many opponents. He's going to stay because there's opposition. He's going to stay because it's not easy. You know, this is easy, anybody can do it. But Paul called the apostle, called him to be faithful, prepared him. Uh, in, in, In a strange way, You can't blame God for evil, but in a very strange way, God used Paul's violent opposition to the Christian faith to shape his mind so that Paul, as he describes himself later on to his young friend Timothy, he says, he says, I I am the chief of sinners because I was violently aggressive against the people of God. I persecuted the way, followers of the way, even unto the death, but God was gracious to him. And in, in the, in the, Strange providence of God. God used all of that to make Paul the person that he would be. Listen, Paul's going to stay in Ephesus until Pentecost because there's opportunity and because it won't be easy. There's opposition. I challenge you. When the classes get tough, they will. When relationships get frayed, and and they will. When you get homesick, many of you will. When you worry about the money, all of us do. Persevere. Trust in the hands of God. Don't give in. Don't give up. You have a great opportunity before you that's life-changing. And it comes, last word, it comes from the hands of God. Don't despise this. It comes from the hands of God. Paul says, there is opened for me. He didn't open the door. He says, the door is open for me. The, the grammatical construction uh, is, is sort of like what sometimes, it's, it's not technically this, but it's, it's like what's sometimes called the divine passive. The, the agency underneath it is the hand of God. The door is opened for me. The opportunity has been given to you by God. It's a powerful opportunity. The door is, is wide. It's a huge opportunity. It's a life-changing opportunity. It won't be easy, but it's come to you in the hands of God. Graciously receive it. Graciously receive the opportunity to have your heart, your mind challenged and changed. And maybe even in these days, as sometimes happens to, to students, to have their faith renewed and deepened in Jesus Christ. Or even for some, for the first time, to commit themselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Here's the opportunity. By the grace of God, seize it.